fruits of success. In examining the forces at work here, we can unfold a creative Newman that heals the ignorance and bloodshed of Dr. Frankenstein's world, a world all too much like our own. Frankenstein is a tale of conflict, of irreconcilable contradiction. This conflict rages between Frankenstein and his nameless creation. Like Kafka's anonymous accusers, this creation is the form of Frankenstein's guilt come to haunt him with nameless cries for revenge. Like Kafka's bewildered victims, Frankenstein knows he is guilty without knowing what he has done. There is even a deeper similarity here. We now know that all of Kafka's stories depict and disguise form a personal dilemma the love between men condemned by society and nameless accusations are in reality charges of homosexuality. And Frankenstein's dilemma also is intimately involved with love between men. But in this case, Frankenstein stands accused of love of Actually, I would say now, a failure of nerve, <laughs> what he needed to have, not really, he wanted to live, uh, he just had a failure of nerve. It's not surprising that much of Western literature should be concerned with this issue, for this issue is basic to Western society, forbidden, damned, punished again and again. The forms of this love flop fester in the darkness, breeding monsters. This love I refer to as archetypal, universal, it is called gay love today of which homosexuality is one aspect. However, we are not concerned here with instinctual acts, but with the primordial roots, the numinous source. Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein, is not accused of being a latent homosexual. I am accusing uh, Mr. Shelley of being <laughs> If we can characterize Western society as a form of masculinity alienated from the feminine, then from a different angle as a form of masculinity alienated from itself. The same impulse which condemns women and the eternally feminine also condemns gay men and the brotherhood of souls. So, uh, sometimes I will refer to gay people, I'm obviously really referring to gay men. Jung characterized the soul as a contrasexual element, compensation for the one-sided ego, quote, lady soul, unquote, unquote, he called the inner being of a man, in the sense of the soul connection. But if we step back a moment, might we not see that this opinion itself is a bit one-sided? Do not we sense in Jung's attitude a great fascination for his anima, manifested in his private life as well as in his writings and mistresses and everything? I suspect there is a bias here. If Jung by chance had been a gay person, his psychology might have been different in some respects. As it is, his work was an expression of his own personal individuation and thereby contained those limitations inherent in any single person's experience. Although he had some positive comments to make about gay men, his views, I feel, are definitely those of an outsider, an alien, and carry a negative tone. Hmm. Which I would uh, mo modify now that I've considered more of the material, that it's more an ambivalent tone where it officially has to appear negative. Mm -hmm. I would go farther and suggest that because of the overwhelming cultural emphasis on love between the sexes coupled with condemnation of same-sex love, Jung and the Jungians emphasized the contrasexual eros and the soul, and de-emphasized the, the homosexual eros. The other eros, in part, was relegated to the nefarious realm of the shadow. Constricted by such a limited imagination, it's no wonder that the homosexual eros of the soul has withheld many of its secrets. We must face this clearly. The erotic, numinous, alluringly dangerous soul is as much masculine as feminine. I have suggested the name double for this complement of the anima, anima, assuming they're one or the other, it's the contrasexual figure of the soul. Characterization of the soul as a double of the person is very old, very widespread. The Egyptians called it ka, which had, quote, the same features, the same gait, even the same dress as the man himself, unquote. Many European occultists, such as Paracelsus, Bohm, and Swedenborg, believed each person had an astral body or soul covering, which appeared exactly as a physical body. The Eurons thought the soul was, quote, a complete little model of the man himself, unquote, an opinion they shared with the Malays. The Aranda of Australia believed that people were reincarnations of ancestral spirit beings, quote, whose doubles they in reality are, unquote. This soul double manifested in one shadow, reflection in water, or portrait. We still speak of the, quote, shades, unquote, of the dead, who are often portrayed as pale reflections of the living persons. In traditional Chinese culture, a person's, quote, image, especially if pictorial or sculptured, and thus approaching close to the reality, is an alter ego of the living reality, an abode of the soul, nay, it is that reality itself, unquote. One could influence or harm the soul of another through an image as is still done today in the Caribbean through Voodoo. The nature of the soul doubles revealed in a Gnostic text, 
the hem of the pearl. And this tale, a boy sent on a journey to the east in search of a special pearl becomes lost and forgets his quest. But one day his memory returns, and finding the pearl, he goes home to, quote, the kingdom of his father's house, unquote. As he approaches, he tells us that, quote, my robe of glory which I put off and my mantle which went over it, my parents sent to meet me by their treasurers who were entrusted therewith. Its splendor I had forgotten, having left it as a child in my father's house. As I now beheld the robe, it seemed to me suddenly to become a mirror image of myself. Myself entire I saw in it, and it entire I saw in myself, that we were two in separateness, and yet again one in the sameness of our forms. Quote. The quote, robe of glory, unquote, is the form of one's own godliness. And the Indian parable puts it this way, quote, Behold upon the self-same tree two birds fast found companions. <laughs> Again, let's below that bell. Two birds fast found companions sit. This one enjoys the ripened fruit. The other looks but does not eat. On such a tree my spirit crouched, deluded by its powerlessness, till seeing with joy how great its lord and found from sorrow swift release. Unquote. It's interestingly a love song, part of a love poem. We might call the double embodiment of the spirit of the self, quote, that inner friend of the soul, unquote, concerned with one's self-realization. I'm suggesting there, by the way, that Jung homophobically could not call this experience he himself was having on the sexual. And to use other words, other terms, this inner friend, and so on. Other cultures have had many words for these kinds of things, so that he's He's hiding from something we see when he uses that terminology about that in a contemporary sense, I'm making a front about it. I'm making an implicit criticism. In myths and tales, he is that twin who aids his brother in heroic quest, who rescues him when he gets in trouble, as in the fairy tale that side by one fronts the two brothers. Often he appears as the immortal twin and embodiment or agent of a god. Thus, with Enkidu in the epic of Gilgamesh, who was explicitly created by the gods for the hero. In the Amphitryon, the popular myth of the Greeks and later the Romans and Renaissance Europeans. Zeus impersonates the man Amphitryon in order to deceive his wife Alcmene. He lays with her, and nine months later she gives birth to twins, Iphicles, fathered by Amphitryon, and Heracles, fathered by Zeus. If we view Amphitryon slash Zeus as one being, then we see that it is one's soul double as agent of the self which generates the hero, the quest for individuality. Among many people, this sense of soul double result in the idea that two of the identical pair was a more perfect representation of the whole, of the strength and oneness of a person. Thus, twins were seen as numinous and often worshipped, this belief held in much of Africa, Australia, as well as among peoples of the ancient Mediterranean. Dioscuri were very prominent in Thebes, as well as Sparta, which also had twin kings. The Romans, in their turn, quote, were fascinated by the idea of twins, too. Legendary founders were better than one, two men named Scipio, who found take the measure of Carthage, two consuls should share the executive office. A similar manifestation of the double concern the institution of blood brotherhood of two men united forever in each other's hearts and interests. This institution occurred worldwide and was a prominent feature in many societies. In stories of twins and brothers, we generally find two motifs that of the loving, supportive brother and that of the antagonistic brother. I have termed these the partner and the competitor, respectively, who appear in the Iliad, the poem in the Iliad, for example, as Patroclus, respectively, Patroclus and Hector. However, as you might expect, the partner and the competitor are secretly one, or opposite sides of the same function. Whether the double appears in positive or negative form depends in large part on the attitude of the ego. For example, in the tale of Monkey by Wu Cheng Pen, a 16th century writer from King Shu, quote, quote, the king of Krokok, who what, has ill-treated the Bodhisattva Manjusri, a divinity disguised as a begging priest, is punished by Buddha by being replaced on the throne for three years by Manjushri's blue mane, lion steed, which is turned into a counterfeit of the king and drowns in a well. The king's remorse earns forgiveness, resuscitation, and reinstatement." Unquote. In this tale, which also exists in several independent European versions, the king is closed off from his deeper self, the realm of spirit represented by the begging priest. The soul double sent to illuminate the king appears as a usurper and murderer. However, as soon as the king accepts his error, he gains her core with the great source of the divine and the competitor withdraws. The unity of competitor and partner is again revealed in the epic of Gilgamesh, where Enkidu functions in both roles. At first he opposes Gilgamesh, but they realize their love during a wrestling match, and then they undertake their heroic quest. The first approach of the dull may appear as a challenge, quote, because we cannot get accustomed to the idea that we are not absolute master in our own home, unquote. The selfishness of the ego, that's a quote from Jung. 
The selfishness of the ego can only see its soul twin as a usurper. This is a problem with Gilgamesh. She has no deep or vital concerns and squanders his time and many abuses of his kingly rights at the beginning of the story. Enkidu, who brings the keys to great mysteries, only seems like oh, another obstacle to the king, ego's arrogant pursuits. Quote, the bride waited for the bridegroom, but in the night Gilgamesh got up and came to the house. Then Enkidu stepped out. He stood in the street and blocked the way. Mighty Gilgamesh came on Enkidu, met him at the gate. He put out his foot and prevented Gilgamesh from entering the house. So they grappled, holding each other like bulls. Unquote. Enkidu confronts Gilgamesh with his own narrowness. <laughs> This wrestling match then becomes the pivotal test for Gilgamesh. <coughs> the creative Newman is at stake. To die in their mutual hate or be, or be born through their union. The solution is a mysterious one. Quote, Gilgamesh bent his knee with his foot planted on the ground when the turn Enkidu was thrown. And then immediately his fury died. When Enkidu was thrown, he said to Gilgamesh, there is not another like you in the world for your strength surpasses the strength of man. Unquote. So Enkidu and Gilgamesh embraced and their friendship was sealed. Unquote. It might seem as if Gilgamesh is defeated Enkidu, but it's not so. Enkidu does not acknowledge defeat, but rather the hero's strength, his ability to hold his own in the contest. We see this more clearly in the parallel story of Jacob and Esau in the Old Testament. In this tale, notice by the way the use of tales uh, is very Jungian. This is a Jungian term, term. Anthropological features, the other kinds of, the bringing of other uh, sources of material. It's, it's typical classical Jungian style. Uh, in this tale, Jacob flees from his wrathful twin Esau because he has stolen the blessing Isaac intended for Esau. He put on furry things that fake. Esau was hairy, and Jacob was not. He put on furry things that tricked his father, who was blind and couldn't see, and got the blessing that his brother was, was supposed to get. Uh, in this tale, Jacob flees from his wrathful twin Esau because he has stolen the blessing Isaac intended for Esau. Years later, Jacob must return to the land of his uh, family, but is afraid Esau will try to destroy him. The night before they meet, Jacob wrestles with a strange man. Quote, the man saw that he could not throw Jacob and said, let, in quote, let me go, for day is breaking, end quote. But Jacob replied, in quote, I will not let you go unless you bless me, end quote. He said to Jacob, what is your name? And he answered, Jacob. The man said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you struck with God and man and prevailed, and he gave him his blessing there, end quote. In the morning, Jacob meets himself peacefully and without harm. From both these stories, we see that the solution to the problem of the competitor is to meet him and embrace him by summoning the strength to be intimate, not to flee from him or destroy him, but to hold him despite the force of diametric opposition. He is transformed into a blessing. It is this erotic gesture, the seed of love and the pit of hate, by which the ego can release the soul's creativity and deny through the ego's own selfishness. So selfish here in the sense of identifying with the defenses of involving social bigotry. The function of the competitor, in effect, is to confront the ego with itself, with its own limitations. The soul puts on a mask of one's sterility and fruitlessness in order to taunt complacency. This, needless to say, is a vital function. The competitor is a form whereby our ignorance moves us to individuation. It is the ego's watchdog signaling the need for new openness, for deeper strengths and skills. The successful ego may move through cycles of challenge and rapport, in which confrontation releases creative development, which in turn leads to new resistances. Of course, the tension caused by the competitor can be very dangerous indeed, for it is negative in tone, hateful, frustrated, jealous, the gap may be too wide to bridge, the ego too proud or too weak. Then one is damned to perpetual conflict like, like the brothers in the Norse Hedel saga, whose forgetfulness of their siblinghood plunges them into eternal conflict. Or else one flees from the challenge, thereby summoning a revengeful ghost, the death of the soul. The road to growth is shut, leaving death and life, insanity, murder, or suicide. In reflecting one's own condition, the competitor may take on aspects of the shadow. Indeed, there isn't always a clear distinction between double and shadow, and shadow is the inferior self, and one's morally inferior self, and one's soul twin may shade off into a rather ugly fellow, a depraved wretch, or even something not human. In many societies, it was believed that the soul could appear in one's shadow as well as, or instead of, in one's reflection. And it was a common belief that an evil sorcerer or witch could impersonate, steal, or control one's soul twin through the shadow. Thus, the devil may confront a person as her or his own inferior ego in the shadow, full of malice. A classic example is Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Another occurs in Tolkien's Ring trilogy, in which uh, the Iliad's triad of Achilles, Patroclus, and Hector becomes that of Frodo, Sam, and God. <laughs> On the other hand, the partner figure may complement the ego with valuable shadow characteristics. 
the German writer John Paul was very fond of such twins, who are the central ones.